Back when I was still a senior in high school, me and my mom went on a trip to the movies. It was this regular mother-daughter bonding ritual we used to have. Catch a movie, critique it, and then hit up the Bob Evans next door for dinner. We'd always stick up my dad something in a takeout box too, and I really miss those days. But anyway, we have our food to drive home just like we always did, and the rest of the night was uneventful. But the next morning, I wake up to a Facebook friend request from a name I didn't recognize. Thinking it might have been a mutual, I just accept it. But then like five minutes later, I get a message from the same account that says something like, hey, I know this might sound a little weird, but I saw you at the Bob Evans last night and I wondered if you might like to go out sometime. So I'm like, huh? How did someone figure out my name? Did they overhear my mom say it or something? Like I get it was polite, but it still creeped me out. Why would you go to those lengths to find me? And you must have been looking for hours. Immediately, there's all these red flags, so I had no intention of accepting his invitation. But at the same time, I didn't want to be a jerk to him. So I messaged him back like, hi, yeah, I was there. But I'm actually kind of seeing someone right now, and I don't think they'd be too happy if we went out. At first, their reply was encouraging, and they seemed to take it on the chin. They said like, ah, that sucks. Sorry if this is awkward now. I respond, no, don't worry, you didn't know. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, though. It was a close-ended reply, you know, the kind that's designed to just end the conversation. Next thing, he starts typing and I figured he's gonna just carry on being gentlemanly, creepily direct, but gentlemanly, I suppose. But no, there's this very subtle shift in his tone when he says, I just figured since I went to all this effort to find you, you might give me a chance. This is where I saw a kind of, well, opportunity. I had literally zero clue how this guy had found me. And I didn't like the idea that just anyone could look me up online no matter how innocent their intentions were. So I straight up asked him, how did you find me? He starts typing and stopping, typing and stopping, and I can tell he's thinking of the right way to phrase it. Then he says something like, where there's a will, there's a way. I can find anyone online. It's easy. When I set my mind to something, I'd achieve it. Is your current boyfriend an overachiever like that? I distinctly remember him using that term, overachiever. It was honestly so cringe. If I wasn't put off before, I certainly was then. But still, I wanted to find out how this creep had managed to track me down. So I might have done something stupid to get him to talk and said, honestly, no. And it's kind of hot that you're so smart and stuff. So how did you do it? He responds, I was the one who swiped your mom's card, he replied. So a liar too. He wasn't some hacker. He just worked at the Bob Evans. So yeah. You probably had overheard my name, then just matched it up with the name on my mom's card. Then bingo, he finds me on Facebook. I had to hold back from just letting loose on this guy. But if he was that much of a psycho, then I figured it was better to not make him mad. Ah, so sneaky, I like it, I replied. But like I said, kind of seeing someone right now, so thanks, but no thanks. Bye. I mute the conversation, but don't block the guy or unfriend him or anything. See, making him mad, I was worried about. Then I just go about the rest of my day. Yeah, I told all my friends how creepy it was and I casually suggested to my mom we pick a new food venue for our post-movie dinners. But other than that, I just went about my day as usual. It's kind of weird how this pattern repeated itself. The first time I'm asleep blissfully ignorant that some creep is plugging my name into Facebook, probably to purr at my display picture. The second time I had him on mute, so I had no idea what was going on in that little message thread. It wasn't until later on that night that I opened my messenger on my phone and actually saw the little 44 notification count next to his name that I realized he'd sent me other messages. And yes, it did say 44. He'd sent 44 different messages, mostly ranks, and he'd been sending them on and off all day. But it wasn't until I actually read what they said that I started to freak out. I'm not going to type out everything I remember him saying, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you will be able to guess the majority of it. Think nice guy style put downs coupled with threats of actual violence. He basically said that if he managed to track me down online in a few hours, imagine what he could learn by the end of the week. He said he had friends that would help him break into our house. After that, they tie my parents up, kill them in front of me, then take turns abusing me until I was used up and lifeless. And that's the clean version of it, condensed into two sentences. 44 different lengthy messages he sent me. Think about that. The final message I read, it went on. Before I ran downstairs to tell my mom and dad was the message that read, I'm in my car and I'm looking for your house. I didn't know he was just trying to scare me, so I was crying as dad called the cops. The guy ended up getting arrested for the threats he made, 
and I know he got fired from the Bob Evans because my mom kicked up a stink about it after the arrest. I never saw the guy again, so I'm thinking it was a case of his bark being louder than his bite. But I know that there are other women out there who aren't so lucky, and their stalkers are much more willing to get up close and personal. I just hope we can one day live in a world where men don't act all predatory and creepy with women they like. Like it's so counterintuitive to what we want in a man. I wish they'd just understand that. But till then, I suppose all we can do is be safer online and with dating apps and hope we never run into that one sick psychopath that won't take no for an answer. This took place in the late 1990s, not too long after I graduated high school. A little backstory first, I met this guy when I was about 14 or 15. He was older than me. I never really knew his age since he often lied to me about it, but he was at least a few years older than Lee. He became my off and on summer fling slash romance for a few years, nothing really serious. When I was a senior in high school, we connected during the winter one night and he asked me to be his girlfriend. I did like him a lot, so we started dating full time. He was sweet. I missed most of the red flags like him warning about all the other guys and noticing me if I wore a dress or something. Right after my 18th birthday, we moved in together. I was still in high school, and I had an after school job, so I thought I could handle it. Plus, I thought it would be a helpful life partner and we could get a life together. I was wrong. I graduated high school and ended up getting two jobs, and he would keep quitting any job he had. I was also preparing to go to a local college. I was determined to do it all though. After about a year of this, and some really crazy fights that became physical, I ended up just becoming numb to the life I was living now. I stay physical, but the truth is, he was physically abusive. Between the physical and mental abuse and torture, he wore me down. I knew I deserved better. I knew he was lying every single time he told me that he would never hurt me again. I also believed him when he told me he would kill me and think nothing of it. I won't tell every single time he beat me, but one of the times I truly thought he was going to murder me. I had been at home with our baby boy while he was out with friends or whatever he was doing. It was a pretty good night. I enjoyed being a new mom, and I had liked the time away from the guy. It was relaxing. I'll refer to him as Asshole. Well, Asshole came home later this winter night, and he had brought a friend with him. I knew the friend, but not too well. They came in the house, and everything seemed to be going okay. But I noticed that Asshole was being a little sarcastic with his tone towards me. It was a fake nice and sarcasm. They usually came before he wanted to start a fight. I then prepared for him to start arguing. I thought that his friend being there would be a safety net of some sort. Boy, was I wrong. I made sure not to do anything to make him mad. I stayed close to my little boy and let him and his friend just hang out, talk, and drink, and whatever they were doing. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what caused him to snap that night. But he did. It was the worst I'd ever seen him. He wanted to fight me. He screamed in my face that he was going to beat me like a man, all while I was holding our baby. His friend followed him, or at least not standing too far away from him. I tried to run, but he blocked me before I could get away. He told me he was going to kill me. I saw his friend just standing there, panicked. I handed him my baby and then said, please don't let anything happen to him. The moment my baby was in his friend's arms, I felt my hair being ripped out of my head. Ashole began kicking and hitting me. I got away long enough to make it to the living room where our landline phone was. I dialed 911. And right as I hit the third, he picked me up and then slammed me down on the ground. He slammed the phone down to hang it up, and then cracked me on the face with it. I thought for sure that that 9 one, one, call didn't go through. He began hitting me so hard and choking me that I was blacking out and seeing Starks as my head spun like crazy. I looked at his friend and I begged him to go get help. He just stood there scared to death. Ashol then told him if he did, he would kill him. I understood in that moment that his friend was truly just as scared and didn't know what to do. I wasn't mad at him for not helping. I was just really thankful that he was protecting my baby. I knew this was going to be it. Ashol was going to kill me like he often said he would. He would have no remorse, just as he promised. I wasn't about to make this easy on Ashol. I fought back, harder than I'd ever fought back before. He was on something, which I later found out, so his strength was definitely not something that I could match. Not to mention he was about a hundred pounds bigger than me, but I was a mom who wanted to live to see my baby pro up. As he hovered over me, hitting me in the head and choking me, I grabbed his balls and twisted and pulled. It didn't faze him. He was so high. 
I was tasting blood and feeling so numb. He was beating me so bad that I wasn't even hurting anymore. Maybe it was the adrenaline in the moment. I don't know. But suddenly the hit stopped. I no longer felt my head getting bashed in, but weirdly enough, I heard a pounding. He got off of me and for a split second, I didn't know what was happening. I wasn't even sure if I was still alive at this point. Finally, I stood up as he told me to be quiet. The pounding was the police knocking on our door. The 911 call had been an open call and the entire fright was heard. Asshole answered the door and he told me to stay back. He started to tell the police some story about the baby just crying. I stepped in the view of the officer who looked at me and he immediately threw our stole against the outside of our home. The rest seemed to happen so fast. I stole was being arrested and an officer was talking to me and taking my statement. One of the cops told me that I had one of the worst injuries he had ever seen a person have and still be alive. Ashole had hurt me so badly that he had beat a hole into my lip where I even couldn't have a drink without the water going through. He called me from jail and the exact words he said to me was, why did you do this? He really wasn't even sorry at all. He didn't even lie to me this time and pretend that he was. I left him. He was eventually sentenced to 26 days in jail. He never served them because he moved to another state before he could be arrested. He managed to find me and stalk me but I stayed strong and stayed away from him. Eventually he had moved on to his next target. I have truly felt so much guilt over this but the next woman was beaten and choked too. But she wasn't just beaten she was also choked to her death. He took the life of someone and I'm sure he thought nothing of it just as he always said to me. I know deep in my heart that if I hadn't walked away it would have been me he killed. But I'm so sorry to that woman's family. He's in prison now probably feeling no remorse at all, and hopefully he's getting justice served to him in other ways. I'm just so glad that I actually got away from him. I'm a cow farmer in the Midwest. It's not the best work, but it is work, and with how hard it is to find a job with decent pay these days, I've learned to appreciate it. The job entails cleaning up after the cows, checking their hooves, milking, and helping them give birth when necessary. It's a pretty messy job when you look at it from the outside, but I've gotten pretty used to it. I don't even smell the stink anymore like I did when I first started. It used to be almost unbearable, but now really nothing. The farm was my father's before me and his father's before him, and the story I'm about to tell you is my dad's. He told it to me back when I first started the job as almost what not to do when tending to the animals and working on the farm. He's long past now, God rest his soul, but this story has haunted me for years, so I figured I'd let other people hear it and judge it for themselves. This is back in the 60s when dad was in his early 20s. He worked on the farm with his father, Bill, at the time. He hated it. He hated the stench that would only get worse when the heat came in the summer and picking up after the cows was the worst. See, the cows stayed in this huge barn. It was actually more like a big warehouse where they're fed and kept throughout the night. They got to graze during the day and throughout the night the cows would defecate and their feces dropped to the concrete floor beneath them. Then in the morning when the cows would go to graze my dad would take a really long hose and spray the droppings to the end of the building down a shaft that leads to a big tank below the barn. The tank would fill with the droppings and once a week we had a guy that would come by and empty the tank and dispose of the waste. It was really nasty work but my dad did it nonetheless. Well, my grandfather decided that was just too much work to do on the farm with just himself and my dad, so they decided to hire another farmhand. They didn't get anyone interested in the job for the first few weeks until they met a man at a local feed store named Fred. He was in his late 20s and eager to work. He hadn't had a job in years and was desperate for pay since his wife was pregnant with their first child. My grandfather hired him right there in that feed store and by the next day Fred was on the farm working harder than anyone my dad had ever seen work. He was determined and super ambitious. He was constantly running around the farm fixing stuff that needed fixing and trying to learn absolutely everything it was that they did. He loved the job and told everyone how he just wanted to be good at what he was being paid to do. He believed in good honest work and that people should earn the money they're working for. My dad admitted he loved having Fred around not just because he worked hard, but also because he was gullible and pretty easily manipulated I guess. My dad had certain tasks given to him by my grandpa throughout the day and each time he was told to do something he just passed that task along to Fred. He didn't mind because he didn't know and my dad didn't care because it meant less of the work that he hated. About four months went by with Fred doing most of the work around the farm and my dad even started to find it a little funny that he really would do whatever he was told. Without question he was happy to do it. 
One hot summer morning, the cows had just gone out to graze and my grandpa told my dad to spray the droppings down the shaft at the end of the barn like he usually did. My dad then passed the job along to Fred as he sat along the side of the barn to have a smoke. When Fred was done, he came outside to tell my dad that he had an idea that he thought would highly benefit the farm. He told my dad that if he emptied the tank below the barn themselves, they would be able to use the cow feces as manure in the fields. It would fertilize the plants and make them grow bigger and faster. My dad told me that at first he thought the idea was stupid, but then he figured it would be funny to see if Fred actually tried and emptied that feces tank so he agreed. He didn't tell my grandpa because he knew he never would have approved and he just wanted to see how this would play out. He showed Fred where to go to the release valve and empty the tank into the big barrels. He told him to be very careful and to not turn the valve too fast otherwise the line would get clogged and they'd have to call someone to fix it. My dad then left Fred alone to do what he had planned and decided to take a walk around the barn to check the gates and make sure everything was in order. What my dad didn't know at the time was that Fred would end up turning the valve too fast and the line would end up being clogged. Fred would then open the tank from above and reach a pole into the sludge to try and dislodge whatever was blocking the line. My dad heard screaming coming from inside the barn and he rushed over to see what was wrong. He made his way down into the tank and was horrified by what he found. Fred had fallen into the huge 5,000 gallon tank that hadn't been empty for a week and was now drowning in the thick feces, desperately reaching out for help. By the time my dad got to the top of the ladder and looked into the tank, all he could see was Fred's hand poking out of the brown goo. He grabbed onto it and tried pulling him out, but he had no leverage at all on the top of that tank. He managed to pull Fred up long enough for him to tell my dad that he was just trying to fix it himself since he knew that they'd have to pay someone for his mistake. He felt bad and my dad reassured him everything would be okay to just hold on. And that's when his grip failed and Fred plunged back under the thick excrement once again. This time no part of Fred's body was able to be grabbed onto to possibly rescue him. My dad had no idea what to do so he ran across the farm as fast as he could to get my grandpa who immediately called the police. By the time they made it back to the tank, Fred's hand had disappeared under the sludge and there was nothing my dad and grandpa could do but wait. The police showed up with firemen and they didn't know much of what to do either. They ended up reaching a metal pole down into the tank with a sort of loop on the end and when they pulled Fred out it was very clear that he had passed. My dad was horrified and felt like it was his fault. He knew it was a bad idea but thought it would be funny. He could have stopped Fred but his own arrogance let him do it. Fred's wife became a widow and she never remarried. She named their son after him and eventually moved out of town. My dad made a point to work as hard as Fred did every day for the rest of his life in honor of the man whose death he felt he was responsible for. My dad passed away in 2018 and the last thing he said to me was to never take advantage of someone's hard work.